Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining the Scaling Your Wish to 3,000 plus customer session. Uh, we got a bunch of great speakers here that have kind of been there and done that. I think we're going to be able to learn a lot today. Uh, before we jump into that, just a reminder that there is a play to win tab on the left hand side. So we're running contests all day long. At the end of the session, you'll get a code for watching this session, which gives you 25 points to those contests. So uh, please hold out to the end uh, to, to see that code. So with that, uh, I'm just going to jump into everything. Uh, my name is Dan Seaman with Perseem. Um, I'm going to be moderating the session. My background, I've worked with ISPs basically my whole life, from owning a small ISP to giant ISPs and, of course, fixed wireless with Perseem. Uh, so again, I'll be moderating. Uh, speaking on the panel today, we have Matthew Carpenter. Matthew is one of four business partners that started Amarillo Wireless, now called AW Broadband. The company was started eight years ago and has grown to 7,000 plus customers servicing 34 towns and much of the rural area between those towns. And they've also added uh, cable and fiber in the last few years. We also have Matt Larson, who's the founder of Vistabeam, which serves Wyoming, Colorado, South Dakota, Nebraska, and, and Nebraska. Um, Matt's one of the innovators in the wireless industry, having um, helped start WISPA and is a past president of WISPA as well. And we also have Jason Pond, who's the co-founder and CEO of Grizzly Broadband, a telecommunications provider located in Missoula and Bitterroot Valleys in Western Montana. Grizzly Broadband is actually his second WISP, and Jason is an innovator in the internet business and has over two decades of entre entrepreneurial experience in the telecommunications and wireless industry. So these guys have built big wisps. And I think, again, we're going to be able to learn a lot from that. So I'm going to pass this off to, um, to Jason to get started. Thanks. Thank you, Dan. And good afternoon, everybody. <clears throat> so we want to talk a little bit about how to get above 3,000 customers. And so as you're going uh, and you're growing your business and you're growing uh, through, you've probably topped 1,000 at this point and things are starting to seem a little easy. Maybe you got a couple people hired and uh, you're looking to uh, that 3,000 plus mark. And we look at that 3,000 plus mark because there's a little bit of a extra barrier to where you're gonna start having to hire some more people and you're gonna have to start implementing a few things. One of the things that we um, really focus on in our company is very proactive network management. So um, I, I use the phrase, you want to know when a mouse sneezes. And we take that quite literal. So we want to know when anything hiccups, when anything burps. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that you want a text message every time something burps, because trust me, there's burps going on in your network all the time. However, that data that is provided by that extra proactive network management is invaluable when you start troubleshooting problems. One thing that we've noticed, uh, you know, when we've got 19 different towers up is you start to get little burps on here and there and little burps here and there. And you find out that maybe somebody changed the frequency and you're getting some interference. Maybe um, somebody added an antenna uh, ran a cable. Uh, we've had zip ties pinch our cable. I've had tower climbers accidentally step on our cable and cut a wire. You want to know all of that information and you want to know when it happens. Um, it, it goes very key into your customer experience. And as you're growing up there into that 3000 subs, your customer experience is going to be very key. So uh, as you continue to grow, you know, 3,000 subs, you're going to have quite a few towers. Like I said, we've got uh, a little over 19 towers right now, continuing to add more as we grow by each year. And the bigger you get, the more pages you get off of your system. So the more pages come in and it just seems like you're just going crazy that, you know, the bigger you go, uh, the more things seem to keep going wrong, keep going wrong. And really, it's just the, because of the scale, right? When you were first started off, maybe you had one, two, five towers, and it just didn't seem like very many things went wrong. You know, maybe it was one a once a month. Well, all of a sudden, you got 19, 20, 30, 100 towers. Stuff's going to happen all the time. And so you always have somebody running and going, and it just seems like it keeps getting bigger. Redundancy. Uh, I can't preach on this enough. Uh, backhaul redundancy is critical to fixing stuff. Having uh, extra routers and switches on hand, we'll get into that in a little bit, but having that redundant backhaul solution so that you don't lose access 
um, if your backhaul goes down. Maybe it's a five gig and somebody put up something and caused some interference. Maybe it's an 11 gig and you just had a, a power supply failure. You know, you never know what may happen, but it's the only way you're going to get a good night's sleep. And so we use um, we use the mentality that we will run out and fix it if it's customer affecting. So if customers are down, we'll go out immediately. But we try to build all of our towers so that in the event of a power failure, we have plenty of battery. In the event of a backhaul failure, we have a redundant link that can at least sustain. So we don't have to rush because we don't want to play firefighter all day long. Um, you know, as Dan said, I've been doing this for two decades and firefighting and firefighting after firefighting, you know, about 20 years is as much as you can last in doing firefighting all the time. So that just helps along those situations where you can go with it and then standardization, but don't hold sacred cows, right? So, uh, just because you standardize the tower doesn't mean that there's not a better way or some tweaks that you need to do. So I call it standardization with revisions and then know which revision each tower site is on. So you have all the right parts and don't make a revision. So when, when you're going and you have tower a and that has, maybe it's a, a micro router and switch a couple of cambium or ubiquity APs up those um, and you're using a certain type of cable and doesn't mean that the next tower you're going to go put in a Cisco router and Mimosa APs and Bicells APs, you know, that that's not a different standardization or revision of that standardization. That is a completely different tower. So when I say different revision means, okay, I use the, uh, see, um, a Microtech 1009 at this tower site and a 1036 at this tower site because I needed an up a bigger tower or I needed more power at that site. Those little tweaks, you know, uh, is this tower running AC versus DC? And I highly recommend DC for all of your tower sites. It just runs a lot cleaner. So as we talk about redundancy, we talk about spare, you know, having that redundancy. One of the biggest things that we want to have in redundancy is we want spares. You want to have inventory so that if you have a backhaul failure, if you have an AP failure or a router failure, you can run out and fix it without having to order, spend time waiting, uh, overnight shipping, those are all stuff you can avoid if you just have an extra router sitting on the shelf. A lot of this stuff isn't that expensive. Even if you get into the big backhauls, you know, you're running, uh, we run CI backhauls for a lot of our network and we keep one spare unit on the shelf. That way, if we have a failure, we're not having to call the distributor in a panic because if you've been paying attention to any of the inventories here over the last few months, uh, there's some stuff that's backordered and you don't want to be stuck in that situation where you have a tower down and all the equipment is all of a sudden backordered. And what we've noticed in the last 20 years of WISP space is any little hiccup in the supply chain can cause those backorders to last for months. Um, so make sure you have a spare uh, previous company I worked for that so we called it the red shelf, you know, and each area had its own red shelf and it, it did. Um, it had sparing backhaul, sparing APs, routers, switches, uh, DC power units, all of those things that would, um, you know, you could go in, grab the unit, head out into the field and get those things replaced. Inventory forecasting becomes a big deal. Um, when you're 3,000 subs, you know, maybe you're growing by 40 or 50 customers a month. Maybe you're growing by 100 customers a month you need to forecast out so that that inventory shortage doesn't affect you. You should be able to accurately forecast out six months, not saying you have to have six months of inventory in stock, but you should be able to forecast out and put those purchase orders in, create those relationships with those vendors um, so that you can create a purchase order agreement that says, I'm going to buy 40 radios a month for the next six months. That way that distributor can have those in stock and know that that's what you want and be able to get to uh, so they come in and you're not having to wait. That that has been invaluable to us in the past three months. 
having uh, a couple different purchase agreements in place uh, so that we didn't get stung by some of the back orders that happened. Um, one-offs cost you money, they're frustrating, and they cost time, which amounts to more money. So uh, just don't do one-offs. Create your standardized towers and don't say no when somebody's like, oh, well, we can just easily do this because that's what we have in stock. Get the right parts. And if you do a one-off, make sure you fix it as fast as you can. We had to do some one-offs. We did run out of uh, some equipment. Um, we, we missed our, our forecasting by a week uh, here a couple months ago. And so we ran out of routers. We still had routers in stock. We just didn't have the brand we wanted that we were using. Uh, and so we said, okay, we got six installs. We got to go get done. Uh, the rest of them we can push and we can wait till we get our routers in. We went and did the six installs and they got flagged. Those then, um, as soon as the new routers came in, the first six off the shelf, we created truck rolls and we went out and replaced them. So we didn't have one-offs out in the field. Um, those one-offs will cost you time and time and time again. No questions about it. Have a scheduling system. Um, whether it's for dispatching, uh, proper routing. If you're at 3,000 subs, you probably cover a fairly good size area. Um, and you're gonna want technicians to go in a fairly smooth path along that route so that they're not bouncing. Uh, we cover a 100 mile stretch, right? So I don't want somebody starting in the middle of our 100 mile stretch and driving 50 miles to the south on job one and then 100 miles north to job two because we just created you know, two hours of drive time of complete waste. And if you're driving, you're not making money, right? So the, the, further, the more time your technician's sitting behind the wheel, the less money you're generating off of that technician. So you wanna be able to go out and efficiently route those uh, field techs and service call technicians so that when you hit point A, the next stop, it may be five or 10 miles, maybe it's 20 miles, but it's the closest possible point that you can do. And using a dispatching system or a routing system has definitely um, been very positive in how we've handled things. And so to come into a recap of the things I talked about, proactive network management, make sure that you are proactively watching your network. Don't just react to fires all day long. Uh, it'll wear you down, it's high stress, um, and it's probably the number one reason why WISPs decide it's time to sell. Inventory control, uh, make sure you have redundancy, make sure you have forecasting so you know how many units to buy. You have the cash flow at 3,000 subs, you have some cash flow to be able to, to stock up on some inventory and not run into shortages. Shouldn't be any excuse for it. And then dispatch for efficiency. So you're making sure that you're getting the proper routing done and that you don't have any uh, people running 100 miles one way to 100 miles another way. I mean, in our area, that's an, that's an hour and a half drive. Um, in other areas, it may be a lot more. And I think from here, I'll pass it off to Matt Larson. Thanks, Jason. Uh, definitely some good stuff in there that... Uh, uh, I wish somebody had told me about before I got bigger. So thank you. Um, so as we get into, you get over about a thousand subs, it becomes more and more important to come up with a consistent quality and consistent standards that you try and follow as you continue to go out and develop your network. So um, I kind of use the McDonald's analogy uh, you can go to McDonald's in a small town, you go to McDonald's in New York City, and you're going to get very similar uh, type of product. So that's done by having that dedication to kind of have that same kind of quality and making sure that you define a constant set of rules. Uh, one of the ways I can illustrate that is it used to be that you would have good installers, people that do a better job than others, and you're always going to have a little bit of that. It's not really, the challenge isn't trying to come up with standards for good installers, it's trying to come up with standards to ensure that uh, as you bring new people on, as you get bigger, you're gonna be able to maintain your same level of quality. So you really have to have those processes lined out that 
you have to go in and specify exactly this is how you drill the hole in the wall. This is how you route your cable. This is the specifications you have on your ground and your drip loop, or uh, this is how you're going to deal with uh, grounding the radio. Um, just stuff like that. Uh, and as you get that established, you'll find that new people, when they are given that information, it actually helps them out. Um, I know early on, I thought that standardization kind of discouraged creativity. That, oh, well, if I just, you know, think, think outside the box, I'm going to try and come up with a different way of doing this. And uh, that becomes really, you can get away with that early on when you're kind of trying to figure out what you want to do. But as you get bigger and bigger, it becomes more important to try and make sure that you're kind of doing the same thing over and over because there's a lot less chance that you're going to be the person going back to support it. So you want to have everything to be as similar as possible so that when somebody else goes back to deal with it, it's going to help. So from that aspect, standardization really provides focus on the things that are actually really important. And it also provides support. So people know that if they follow the instructions on what needs to happen, everything is going to work the way it's expected to work. Um, you know, and there are all kinds of, I can give you all kinds of anecdotes about different things that turned out to be issues over the years. Uh, you know, I've, I've seen situations where, you know, you, you want to make sure that you get the radio at the best possible location to work and not just the easiest one to get to at the ladder. Uh, I, I know early on I had an installer that uh, didn't like to get up on top of a rooftop. So all the installs were basically as tall as his ladder was. And the next guys that we had went out and moved all of the, his radios up higher where we had to do, you know, probably 50 or 75 service calls where uh, trees get leafed out in the spring or, you know, all it needed to do was a radio needed to be moved 10 feet to a better spot. So if we had had better standards at that time, we probably would have not not accepted that kind of that kind of work. So it's really important to provide that focus and support for people. Um, and then the other thing that has to do with standards is the standards are only good if you enforce them. You know, I, I have this great book that I bought. It's called uh, uh, What You Accept is What You Teach. I've never actually opened it, but the title kind of says it all. If you accept shoddy workmanship, if you let people get away with things, then you teach them that they can get away with it. So it's really important to go back and make sure that people are doing a good job, you know, whether it's random quality checks or uh, really audits. And I know one of the things that we've done with a lot of our field work is we actually have a checklist of items that somebody goes out in the field has to provide. There has to be a picture of the speed test. There has to be a picture of the signal strength and modulation rates. There has to be a picture where the wire goes in the house, be a picture of where it's mounted, be a picture of line of sight point it back to the tower where it's at. So we have this entire checklist of all these things that they have to go through in order for that install to be approved. Um, we also do audits on, on every, every day when uh, the guys get done, they turn that in. We have somebody actually checks that list. So we've had that checklist for a long time, but what we found is uh, people just kind of use that as a, that's a general guideline on how to do an install. Well, when we actually started having an office person go through and make sure that all those items were there, then that became a lot more important. Uh, in fact, we, we actually established something. We initially called it the queue of shame for people that failed to do all the work that was necessary on their checklist. So you didn't want to be on the queue of shame. So people started doing their checklist. So enforcement's really important. Um, and then also kind of going back, and that's something Jason touched on in his, was you want to have revisions. So... You want to probably on an annual basis go back and review your standards. You know, we started out, you know, we had a certain signal strength level. Maybe it was, you know, 75, 76, somewhere in there. And we've constantly revised it. I think we're down to like a neg 70 or neg 71 is the lowest acceptable signal that we'll take in most parts of our network. So go back and double check and make sure if something's changed that you've got the appropriate change in place to, to uh, account for that. Um, Another thing that's really important is documentation. Uh, you want to document everything as much as possible. Uh, I know that uh, there are a lot of us, so much of the network information, so much of the way the business works is tied up in our heads. And you're never going to scale 
if you keep too much of that information tied up in your own head. You really need to get that out so that people can see it. So if you're not available, that there is somebody else that can solve the problem. So if you have a transition to new employees or somebody leaves the company, you want to have that documentation there because it's really hard to try and decipher what somebody else has done if they didn't document what's going on. So documentation can create huge bottlenecks where things will just grind to a grind to a halt because people can't you have people that can't do their jobs because they don't have the information they need. So that's why documentation is really important. Um, after you get to a certain size, you should really think about developing some kind of an intranet. You don't necessarily have to get very fancy, but uh, I know a lot of us start out with like a simple database or you've got a spreadsheet full of a bunch of information uh, or even a wiki. I know a wiki was one of the things I originally started uh, putting together and uh, it was great, but it was not dynamic, you know, and, I, I, and it required constant revision until we finally figured out a way to uh, create a database that could contain all of our documentation. But uh, get something together that has your important documents in it, that has your standards as, you know, where people can refer to them easily. Uh, the other thing is make sure that it's accessible. Uh, I've had lots of tools that were great. Unfortunately, it turned out I was the only one that knew where they were at or only a couple people knew where they were at. And documentation and good tools are only useful if people know how to find them and how to use them. So you want to make sure that that stuff's accessible. If your documentation, your tools are not accessible, uh, it's just, it's not going to work as well as it should. Um, the other thing that goes along with documentation is getting a ticket system in place. Uh, I believe most of the modern billing systems all have ticket systems built into them. And that's really important for keeping track of what's going on with a customer over the long term. Uh, you know, I've, you can follow the, you can follow the trail a lot of times for troubleshooting uh, with a customer if you see certain issues coming up over and over, then it makes it a lot easier to see what's going on. Also, a lot easier to deal with a customer or look at a situation and say, you know what, if we can't provide this person good service, we should probably give them a refund and give them an opportunity to get business somewhere else. Or if you see a certain technician that's not doing their job properly, you've got the information, the evidence, and all the tools to hopefully fix the problem there. Uh, in front of you in that ticket system. So as you get bigger, it's gonna be more important to use a uh, ticketing system to try and keep track of what's going on with customers. And uh, even within within your system as well, within doing like infrastructure, it's really important for that to keep track of like different progress and things that have been done as uh, people have gone out to do work. So some of the tools you can use for standardization and documentation, you know, I've mentioned uh, Wiki. Uh, I know we're currently trying to develop a more comprehensive intranet uh, type of application. Uh, we've, after the wiki, we, we developed an in-house product that worked for some things. Uh, we also use Microsoft SharePoint. Uh, if you like using Microsoft products, it's a good place to store documents and keep a lot of your information. Uh, but come up, with, come up with something there to keep all that information where it's accessible and people can get to it. Um, getting a centralized calendar is really important. So, uh, you know, as you get bigger, you're going to have a bigger staff, you know, 3,000 customers, you know, you're probably going to have anywhere from, you know, 12 to 20 employees and keeping track of 20 employees is a little bit of a chore. Uh, so you're going to want to get, uh, you're going to want to get something in there for a calendar. Uh, project management is very important, especially on the infrastructure side. So, uh, it's really important to, uh, get that planned out because if you have missing pieces of projects, it can just domino effect into uh, delays and costly overruns. Vehicle tracking, super important. Uh, the bigger you get, you're gonna have more vehicles out on the road. And uh, as Jason said, time driving is not time working, so try and make it as efficient as possible. And then come up with, come up with as much automated reporting where you don't have to go out and manually collect that information. You know, use your billing system, use your tools to get that business intelligence. Um, last thing, uh, dashboards and KPIs. You know, you need your key performance indicators to kind of show whether you're progressing towards your goals or going backwards. Um, you also need that to help determine what your goals are and to make good plans for the quarter for the year. Um, it's, you're going to want to create dashboards for watching your KPIs. 
you know, there can be just oh, hundreds of all these different numbers. You need to kind of get down to like the really important, like eight or 10 numbers you really want to see, and then uh, develop some business intelligence tools for drilling down, looking at more complex things or coming up with a report to address like a specific issue you might have with the network or to try and address a specific thing that you're trying to do. So whatever you're doing as you get, as you continue to scale up, look at getting dashboards and KPIs to kind of tie everything together and be able to check your progress and see how everything's going. So I believe that's everything I had. It is time for Matthew Carpenter from AW Broadband. Hello, everybody. And uh, for everybody watching this, I uh, really appreciate you jumping on the virtual summit and uh, uh, watching all these great guys talk. Thank you, Jason and Matt. Lots of good information. And uh, I hope everybody really gets a lot of good information out of this. And so let me get started here. One of the big things we found when we moved uh, up into the 3000 range, which we moved past that some time ago, but it was a, it was a struggle uh, with, um, with, with hiring people. And so we found ourselves working uh, until one o'clock a.m. a lot of times. Um, we were taking day and night calls from customers. Uh, they were constantly texting, calling. Uh, we, it, there wasn't hardly any family time, basically. Uh, we found that we were two plus weeks behind on installs, uh, going as fast as we could go to install customers. And we started setting down and thinking, it's time to start hiring some more guys. Uh, we trickled them on. We were very picky who we chose. We wanted good quality installs and uh, guys that would then train other guys um, with the, the, the proper method, the proper procedure to do, uh, to do things. Uh, and another one is you need after hours tech support. You can't be the after hours tech support. When you get up in the 3,000 customers, uh, we regularly have three or four people call every night. Um, and that doesn't seem like that many, but three to four at 15 to 20, 30 minutes a piece, they don't want you to hang up. Even if it's 930 at night, they don't want you to hang up. They want you to solve their problem no matter what. Uh, we started sending them off to an after hour support center that does some um, uh, some some basic stuff, reboot router, a few things like that. And they create a ticket, tell the customer we will contact them back the next morning with the ticket. So uh, ticket systems are very important for that, re that, for that reason. So doing these things, hiring on the few, cust uh, few uh, employees that we needed to keep up with installs, to keep us from having to feel like we were working 24 seven was a big thing. And as you get up in that 3000 range, you'll, you'll really greatly appreciate it. I'll never forget the first night we had tech support online and it wasn't me it was like a huge weight was lifted off my shoulders. Um, and uh, it was a great night. One of the big things you need to do is you need to grow with a system. Pick a system now, and we're talking a billing ticketing system uh, that does scheduling and a lot of things. There's two or three really good products out there. And I won't, I won't talk about any one specific product. We have one we really like, uh, but your billing system, in order to really util uh, to utilize it uh, for future growth, it needs to have auto cutoff. If a customer doesn't pay, you need to have auto cutoff. Going through and trying to cut everybody off that hasn't paid and then turning them back on minutes later or hours later, that consumes a lot of time. And so the billing system automatically does that for us. It's been a great thing to have. Um, auto monthly bills and payments. I've talked to some WIS that are around 1,000 to 1,500 and they're using QuickBooks. Nothing wrong with QuickBooks at all, but it's not really designed for this kind of process. Uh, on the uh, uh, seven days before the first, when we send out our billing to everybody, it's an automated process. Uh, letters are printed if they want to get a mail, out, uh, you know, actually get an envelope and a piece of paper at their, uh, at their house um, or an email. It's all automatic. It's great. Um, it reduced us having to have a couple of employees just to take care of billing uh, every, every month. Uh, the other thing is it vets out new customers quickly. When you get a call from a customer, very excited. I'm ready to get this new customer onboarded. Let's get let's get them scheduled. But first, let's have a good utility, a good program that can vet that customer. And what I mean is, do they have good line of sight to a tower? Is there a hill in the way? Um, you know, are they way down low into a canyon? And there's no way they can see the tower. Um, is there a tower close to them? Uh, sometimes we get phone calls from people. They're eight or ten or twenty miles from a tower, and we know there's not any point in going out there and wasting time because we know. Uh, it saves a lot of time and it also uh, tells your customer or potential customer, hey, I'm not going to hold you on the phone or go out there and waste your time. We can figure this out very quickly on the phone. 
Uh, the ticket system was already talked about. I want to explore more on the ticket system. Uh, obviously, we do uh, use it for uh, customers uh, when they call in, when they uh, send an email in. Uh, the ticket system, sometimes they're private tickets, they're internal tickets only for what's happening internally. And sometimes the tickets are customer viewable. They can see what the results are. They can answer back on those tickets. And so we're very careful to make sure we see if it's a visible ticket uh, to uh, the customer or if it's an internal ticket. And uh, because we may be talking about upgrading a tower and things like that, that needs to be an internal discussion. But ticket system is very important. Find a good billing system that has that built in. And then of course, finding areas you are not servicing. One of my favorite things to do is bring up a map pull all the leads up, take a look. Wow, there's a whole area with 150 leads that we're not servicing. We need to figure out how to get over there and get a tower built right away. And so it's a it's a great utility to go out there and find new locations. And as you get into the two and 3,000 range, you'll, you'll be looking for new areas to expand even faster because you'll have that cash flow coming in and you're ready to expand. One of the big things, uh, I enjoy doing is the marketing and sales part. And how do you get to 3000? Well, a lot of it has to do with marketing and sales. You really want to make sure you've got uh, a good team that does this. So how do you grow to that next level? How do you get to that 3000 mark? Set area goals, find those areas that are underserved, set a goal to get in that area. Where am I going to put the tower? How much money am I willing to put into this? Set a monthly budget. So many times I've gotten, uh, I'll, I'll do some posting on Facebook. And I'll have an eight or nine hundred dollar bill from Facebook at the end of the month. I didn't set a very good budget on that, did I? And so I look at the budget. That's EDDM. That's all the different ways we can do uh, marketing. And that's how do you market to those areas? Well, flyers, which is EDDM. That's every door direct mail. It's the cheapest way to do it. It does take time because you have to sort it, you have to count it, you have to deliver it where it needs to go. Um, and because you save money, um, uh, the post office uh, makes you do more work. But I'll tell you what, EDDM flyers always bring out people. Uh, I'm sure a lot of people throw them away, but um, we see a very good uptick in the number of installs in an area when we send out. Uh, Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn, all very good places. Facebook is the, my number one favorite to go and hit an area up. Um, I do a, a boost a post or I'll do an ad and we will have three to four installs scheduled within hours and they continue to come in as long as that, um, that uh, posting is boosted and people are seeing it. And um, I normally do a post boost for around $150. That's a pretty good number uh, for 15 days. Um, that, that's, that's well within budget and it really brings a lot of people uh, out to call and find out more about your service. Kind of talked about network redundancy a little bit. I wanted to talk a little bit more about a few other items. Multiple feed points per tower. Uh, I believe Jason talked about that. But multiple drains. We call them multiple drains to the internet. And what is that? It's a connection to the internet. That's It's going out to the internet. You want to make sure you don't just have one. That's a single point of failure. If you're connected to one internet provider that, uh, that gets you out, and that one goes down or their fiber dies or something, your entire network could be down. That's always good to have. We actually have three of them now. And uh, at any given time, a fiber is cut somewhere and we seem to always have one down on occasion. And, and so thankful we have um, three of them at this point. Obviously, the bigger you get, the harder the impact when one of your connections goes down, especially if it's the only one you have. So make sure you're looking into how can I get a secondary connection and how can I have it going on a different path so that if uh, fiber gets cut, it doesn't take both of them down. Um, hot and cold hardware backup. Uh, definitely, you want to make sure you got plenty of hardware on the shelf. But it's good to have some sitting there ready to go as well that can be switched over to quickly. Um, check your peak times. One of the big things is watching your back calls. Your NMS system should be telling you this information. Make sure that as you add people onto a tower, that you're watching your back call. You're watching your peak times. And what is peak time? Starts around seven o'clock, goes till, we used to name, say 9.30, lately it seems to be 10.30, 11 before it really starts coming down off peak. But keep an eye, when you get to 80% during your peak time, you need to start thinking about upgrading uh, that backhaul. And then of course, residential ver versus uh, commercial. Uh, commercial, they are very demanding. They wanna make sure that you have plenty of redundancy to their location, uh, to that tower. You don't wanna leave them behind. 
uh, requires time and money to do it right, it requires a lot. <laughs> and make sure that you are setting aside the money and the time to make sure your network is redundant, your tires are redundant, everything's good. And that's it for me. Thank you very much. Great. Thanks, guys. Lots of great information there. So before we go into a little bit of Q&A, this is the play to win code I mentioned earlier for everybody watching the session, scaling 3000. So when the session's over, uh, you can jump over to the play to win and, and play with that. Uh, so a couple of questions for you guys. Uh, if you if you had to think back to around 1000 subs, what do you think is the thing you learned that's the most counterintuitive that, that you wouldn't have expected it to be true, but but it is true? <laughs> <laughs> That's a really good question. Uh, is it was it was it the people part was way yeah. harder than you thought, or versus maybe at the beginning the technology is harder, then the people get harder, or something like that? I, I wouldn't say it's counterintuitive, but the more people you get involved, uh, the need to communicate gets exponent. Communication gets exponentially harder. Uh, you know, I, I've seen a lot of guys that start out and, you know, you get like three, four or five people and they're all working together kind of every day in like tight quarters and everybody kind of knows what's going on. And then after a certain point, like, you know, people start to get more and more specialized and then you start to get more distance between everybody. Uh, and it just it just happens as you get bigger. And so I think the communication uh, degradation between people is where that starts. And that's part of why I think it's important to make sure that you've got good ways of kind of making sure everybody's kind of working off the same playbook uh, because it's a lot harder. It's, it's easier to do that when it's like four or five people like really focused. But when you're talking about 15 or 20 or 30 people, that's a completely different story. Any other thoughts? Um, Matt, you mentioned uh, KPIs. Do you guys um, have any favorite KPIs? If you had to pick one or a two or three um, things that you measure that are you know, predictive of the future or, or super valuable, what ones would you, if you, I guess maybe another way, if you had to give a small ISP recommendations on three KPIs they should track over time and monitor from, from now on, what would they be? Well, I think there's two that go together that are very straightforward and that's how many new customers you're adding and how many customers are canceling. And I think people get really focused on the former and don't pay enough attention to the latter. Uh, because, you know, if you go out, oh man, we did a hundred installs this month, you know, it was just totally busy. But if you did like 50 or 60 cancellations because uh, you weren't able to maintain a quality level of service, that's, that's going backwards in, in a lot of ways. So uh, I think, trying to figure out what that net number is, is really important. So you know kind of exactly what your growth is. Uh, the other part is kind of figuring out what your average revenue per user is and tracking that consistently. Uh, that helps a ton when doing planning for, uh, you know, revenue projections, that sort of thing. Um, and then I think kind of keeping track of uh, uh, leads and sales opportunities. Uh, Matt Carpenter was talking a little bit about that. And, uh, you know, that's something I think a lot of guys, or a lot, I should say guys, that's, that's a lot, something a lot of operators take for granted is a lot of times we are going into markets that are, are needing more better broadband very badly or we wouldn't be doing it. And at a certain point, you have to start working for it. You know, there's only so much low hanging fruit. Uh, it's if, if you get your marketing together uh, that really helps. And to do that, you really have to track how many leads you're getting in, how many you're, you're able to convert and that sort of thing. So Dan, can I add a little bit to that? Yeah, um, of course. The, uh, you know, what we've done is each department has their own KPIs. And of course our leadership looks at the key ones and the key ones that Matt hit right on the head, you want to know how much you're growing new and you want to know how much you're losing. But one of the things we do, we do submissions. So we know what that's our sales market, right? That's our marketing funnel. We know it's working. We do um, sales sold. So we know how many we've sold and then we do net growth. And in our billing area, we track cancellations and we've been able to, because of those KPI trackings that we're doing, we've been able to find where exactly our competitors are marketing 
and we're losing to them and what we need to fix within like two weeks. So it, it's, uh, it's become pretty invaluable to say, oh, yep, that's where this, you know, CAF2 build happened and, and uh, we're going to lose a little bit. So, um, you know, that it's worked out really, really valuable. But marketing, sales, um, revenue generated. Uh, I like to use the gross revenue per month and watch it go up versus ARPU necessarily. Um, uh, but that's just to show additional gain per week. So. In, uh, is that a motivation uh, thing, the gain per week for your team? Or for yeah, you? we want <laughs> it, it's it's both. We, we're very we're extremely transparent. Everybody yeah. in our company knows exactly what we've gained each week. So cool. Yeah. Sorry, Matt. And, go ahead. Uh, oh no, that's okay. And uh, Dan, one thing I was going to say on uh, we track uh, one of the KPIs we track is when on a, on a cancellation, uh, we track are they moving? Are they going to a provider, uh, an alternate provider? And uh, we found that there are two or three times during the year that um, uh, 45 to 50 percent of our cancellations will be people moving outside the area that we cannot service. Um, about 10 percent are moving into other areas of town that uh, we cannot service or they've decided to go with an alternative like the cable provider or whatever to get faster speed. And the rest of it um, is either going to another provider or they can't afford it or, you know, they found some alternative method that's not a a competitor and um so it's important to watch those as well because you think you could say oh i just lost 60 people but you find out that 40 of those moved there's nothing you can do about that yeah do you track where they move to to so you can if they're just moving like in an area you could service or do you or just mm -hmm. or not yes we track if they're leaving out of the area so we'll say moving out of the area moving out of the state or yeah. moved into amarillo unable to service due to trees or whatever sure Perfect. So, yeah, it gives you more more area to, more people to target again. It's yeah. always unfortunate if someone moves and that you could have given them service and they didn't know it. Yes, <laughs> for sure. And that happens sometimes. Yes. Yeah. Definitely. I think related to that, I, one thing I forgot to mention is churn rate, and I think the industry churn rate. It's like if you're doing, if you if you're doing better than one percent, if you if you can keep your churn rate below one percent, you're doing really well. Mm -hmm. So that would mean, you know, on average, you know, if you have 3000 subs, you know, you're probably going to lose 30 customers a month, you know, at a 1% churn rate. So you'd want to plan on that, but it's been very interesting. We've, we've really focused on, we actually got rid of a lot of customers that had substandard, you know, signal quality. And, uh, it, it was, it was hard to do that to give up that revenue, but it allowed us to really improve our customer experience. And our churn rate, I was just looking at the spreadsheet for the last uh, 12 months has ranged from 0.75 to 0.27 uh, for our churn rate, which is, I, I, I never thought we'd ever be that low, but that's that's been, it's been really good to see as few as possible. And like Matthew Carpenter said, uh, the majority of the customers we're losing is because of people moving or or death, that, that also happens. Mm -hmm. Cool. We have a just on a related note to that. We have another session in the in the conference, which is about when to say no to customers. So hopefully you can avoid that problem of having to let go ones that are causing more pain for other customers than than you'd like. So uh, that's that's great, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for your time. Um, there is going to be a live text based chat that's online for the next thirty minutes after this session ends. Uh, so please join us there. Um, all of us will be hanging out there for thirty minutes. You can ask some more questions and and hopefully we can uh, share some more, some more knowledge. So again, thank you guys so much for your time. I think that's going to be super useful for the the people not having to make uh, the same mistakes that you guys had to. So uh, thank you. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good one. Have a good one. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you for tuning into this session at the WISP Virtual Summit, proudly presented by Perseem. Perseem is a one-of-a-kind networking solution developed exclusively for WISPs that helps to find and fix quality of experience issues across towers, access points, and subscribers. To learn more, visit Perseem.com today.